So, you're ready to demolish your electricity bills with solar, but feel like you're navigating a maze. Brands, prices, batteries, it's a solar jungle out there, with testimonials from retired cricketers around every corner. In this video, I'll cut through the solar hype and bring you the real deal about solar energy in Australia. I'm stripping down everything to the bare essentials, from decoding the tech speak to navigating solar brands to finding the right installer. Let's get straight to it. Now, there are many reasons to love solar, and let me tell you, I fucking love solar! Almost as much as this guy. But I get it, you probably aren't turned on by glass and silicon. You want solar because you want to stop this happening every quarter. A well-designed solar system combined with choosing your electricity tariff well and smart energy habits can get rid of bill shock for good. In this video, I'll show you how to buy solar panels well. Let's start with how many solar panels you should buy. Now, lots of well-meaning people make this question much more complicated than it needs to be. They want you to look at your average daily use and then use that to carefully calculate the number of panels you should put on your roof. 10 years ago, that was great advice. Today, it's outdated. Because over those 10 years, solar panels are a fraction of the price. Electricity prices have gone through the roof and we're on the verge of fully electrifying our homes and cars. 10 years ago, 6.6 .6 kilowatts was a big system. But in 2024, 6.6 .6 kilowatts is meh. The average system size sold in Australia right now is 10 kilowatts. That's about 25 panels. So should you get 10 kilowatts? Well, if you want to smash your bills and be ready for an all-electric future, the best advice I can give you is to simply fill your roof. Do it once and do it right. Up there, I've got 20 kilowatts powering an all-electric home and two electric cars. Fill your roof is simple advice that works well because the bigger your roof, the bigger your house, and the bigger your house, the more electricity it's going to use. A typical Aussie family home using modern panels can usually fit at least 13 kilowatts on its sun-facing roof areas. If you think that's too big, sure, you'll probably have more solar than you can use on mild sunny days, but you'll love the extra power from that big system in the early morning as the sun rises and you're up making brekkie, in the late afternoon when everyone returns home and electricity prices are at their peak, on overcast days and over winter when you'll want guilt-free heating. And when you get an electric car or home battery, you'll rarely appreciate the extra energy generated. One of the biggest mistakes I see Aussies making when buying solar is falling for the fallacy of averages. They look at a quote for a bog standard 6.6 .6 kilowatt system. The quote says it generates an average 30 units of electricity per day. Then they look at their bill, which says they average 20 units of electricity per day. Surely that's more than enough solar. No, they're setting themselves up for disappointment when usage is above average. Heat waves, cold days, or those drizzly days when the clothes dryer's getting smashed. And honestly, I have never heard anyone complain that they've got too many solar panels. So, how many panels will fit on your roof? Obviously, the bigger your roof, the more panels will fit. The installer will measure your roof with a satellite photo, or even better, come round and measure in real life. Look, by all means, don't spend money you can't afford, but I'd strongly advise at least asking the installer to show you the pricing on a system that fills your north, east, and west facing roof spaces. You'll probably find that those extra kilowatts are very reasonably priced. Do it once and do it right. That gets me on to roof direction. Why did I say fill your north, east, and west facing roof? In the Southern Hemisphere, the sun rises in the east, moves across the north, and sets in the west. So north facing roofs get the most sunlight throughout the day. East and west get a little less sunlight, but get more in the morning and late afternoon. Now the shape of your roof will dictate where your panels go. Fill any unshaded north, east, and west roof faces. It's that simple. Don't overcomplicate it. As well as the direction of your panels, their angle affects their performance too, but not by enough to worry about. We're talking about a few percent difference in energy production over a year. So whether your roof's at the standard roof angles of about 20 degrees or about 30 degrees, it's gonna make very little difference to how much energy you generate. If you have a pitched roof, put your panels at the same angle as the roof 
the expense of tilt frames is simply not worth it. But if you have a flat roof, I do recommend tilt frames because flat solar panels are a bitch to keep clean. Flat panels don't self clean in the rain. But don't tilt them north. You'll fit more panels on your roof if you have east-west tilts like this. Plus, your generation will better match your usage. But what about shading? Shading kills solar. If your roof is heavily shaded, avoid disappointment by paying a good installer to do a shade analysis. The really good old school installers might get on your roof and use a device called a sun eye that literally measures the shade. Or they might use shade analysis software instead. You'll know they've done a proper shade analysis if they put the results in writing on your quote. Filling your roof with solar is one thing, but how much is it gonna cost? What about taking up one of those cheap deals off the telly? Good partnership. G'day, Australia. Rusty balls here. If you're still getting a power bill, you're a bloody loser. Just like the Zimbabweans back in 96. It's rusty ball. Come on, Straya. Get dodgy. Get solar. Get dodgy solar. Be careful. Too cheap risks a poor system design, too much downtime and low performance, destroying your electricity savings. But you also don't want to pay too much. The big risk here comes from predatory door knockers or cold callers who want to charge you $16,000 for a $6,000 system. Hello, young lady. Hello. Is your mother home? Oh, what a lovely young man you are. I was just wondering if you've ever considered buying a totally inappropriate, overpriced solar power system for your home. If you buy today, you will never get another electricity bill and your cups of tea will taste nicer. Oh, I love a nice cup of tea. Would you like to come in? And that's why I created Solar Quotes 15 years ago, to help Australians get up to three quotes from solar installers I've personally vetted. If you want quotes for solar, batteries, or EV chargers, just go to solarquotes.com.au, enter your postcode, and leave it to my team to put you in touch with great installers so you can compare deals. Now let's go through the main components of a solar system and what brands are worth considering. The most obvious component is the solar panel itself. I'm gonna be honest, and the solar panel manufacturer reps will hate me for saying this, but they're a commodity these days. If you buy a reputable brand, chances are you'll be fine. So don't get hung up on finding the perfect solar panel brand. Essentially, you need to decide between budget, mid-range and high-end, and then go for it. Spoiler, if you buy a good brand and they're well installed, they should all produce a similar amount of energy over the next couple of decades. They all have similar efficiencies. They almost all have the same 25 year warranty. There are only two tangible differences. First, degradation. Now all solar panels degrade slightly over time. My favorite panel, the very expensive REC Alpha, has a degradation of about 0.25% per year. A good budget panel like Trina warrants 0.55% per year degradation. So on paper, the top end solar panel potentially loses less than half the energy every year. Sounds like a lot, right? But what's the difference in real money? On a 10 kilowatt system, that top end panel will generate an additional 36 and a half kilowatt hours per year. At 30 cents per kilowatt hour, that's about $11 in electricity. Hmm. Hey, I put expensive REC alphas on my roof because I'm a solar snob. But a good budget brand would have been fine too. The second specification where expensive panels beat budget panels is hot weather performance. Now all solar panels lose efficiency in hot weather, seriously. Panels like light, but they don't like heat. The more expensive panels generally perform better in hot weather. High-end panels lose about 0.26% per degree C over 25 degrees. Budget panels lose more, they lose about 0.34% per degree C. Now that's panel temperature, not the ambient air temperature. So how hot do solar panels get in a heat wave? I climbed on a roof in 40 degrees to find out. 37 degree day at 9 a.m. In Adelaide, we're having a bit of a heat wave. Let's see how hot these solar panels are after they've been baking in the sun for half the morning. So the solar panels are sitting at just over 51 degrees. 
That's 26 degrees more than their perfect temperature of 25. At a panel temperature of 65 degrees, the high-end panel will lose 10% of its power, whereas the budget panel will lose about 14% of its power. But either way, if the sun's blazing and you have a good sized system on your roof, you should have more than enough solar power to crank that aircon. So don't get hung up on high temperature performance of your panels. Now, this chart shows panel brands I consider well supported in Australia, from budget on the left to top end panels on the right. The difference in cost between the good cheaper panels and the top end is about $400 per kilowatt. So the posh panels can add about $4,000 to a 10 kilowatt system. If you want to pay that, like I did, great. But I'm here to tell you that you don't have to. Now let's move on to component number two, the inverter. The inverter is the box of electronics that the solar panels plug into. It converts their electricity into 230 volts AC, so you can use it in your house. With inverters, you have a choice to make. Ready? Do you want a string inverter, a hybrid inverter, or micro inverters? What's the difference? The cheapest, simplest option is a string inverter. It sits on your wall, ideally next to your switchboard, and all your solar panels connect into it. If you want a battery with your solar panels, either now or in the future, then you should consider a hybrid inverter like this. It looks just like a string inverter, but it has an input for batteries as well as solar panels. That means adding a battery is almost as simple as fixing it to the wall and wiring it in to the hybrid inverter. It's called a hybrid inverter because it does two things at once, control your solar panels and your batteries. The catch of course is that a hybrid inverter is more expensive than a standard string inverter. Expect to pay about $1,000 more for a hybrid. But if you add batteries, the hybrid should work out much cheaper because you don't need to pay for the separate battery inverter. And the installation of the battery is much faster too. A quick example, if you want to add about 13 kilowatt hours of storage to your home, a good retrofit option is the Tesla Powerwall. Now one of these fully installed is going to cost you about $15,500 in Australia. If you have a hybrid SunGrow inverter already installed and then add about 13 kilowatt hours of batteries, it will cost closer to $11,000 to add those batteries. Two things to watch out for if you buy a hybrid inverter. One, your choice of batteries is limited to what the hybrid inverter is compatible with, often only the same brand as the inverter. And if you spend too long deciding to add those batteries, compatible batteries may not even be on the market anymore. If batteries are more than a couple of years away for you, probably go for the string inverter. Now, the third choice, micro inverters. Now, these are what I've got on my roof. Instead of an inverter on my wall, each of the 50 solar panels on my roof has its own micro inverter underneath. The main advantage is that there's a lower voltage on my roof. Without getting too technical, the micro inverters avoid high voltage DC, and that's a little safer. And the reason I chose micro inverters for my house is that I decided to build my house out of straw, and I really didn't want high voltage DC going through the straw bales. Some other advantages of micro inverters are that they're great if you've got a really complex roof, and you can monitor panels individually if that's your thing. The downside, these micro inverters cost quite a bit more than string inverters. If you choose micros, expect it to add at least $2,000 to the system cost, and if one fails, some poor bugger's gotta climb on your roof to replace it. And despite all the inverters being on the roof, you're still gonna have a pretty big box on the wall. One of these, it's got communications and circuit breakers in it. Whether you choose string, hybrid, or micro inverters, it's essential that you choose a reliable brand that's well supported in Australia. Here's a chart of brands I trust from left to right, cheapest to most expensive. Now let's talk about monitoring. If you want to monitor the energy flows in your house on an app like this, you usually need an extra bit of hardware commonly called a smart meter, and it looks like this. It's a terrible name because this is also called a smart meter. This smart meter is installed by the electricity retailer who sends you your electricity bills. It's called smart because about every five minutes, it logs your electricity consumption and sends it back to base via the mobile phone network so they can send you a bill. This smart meter measures how much electricity comes into your house and how much is sent out, but it won't share that information with your solar app. So to know what's going on inside your house in real time, you need another little smart meter which can talk to your solar inverter. It looks like this. Now, if you don't have one of these, the only way you can look at your electricity use 
is either via your bill or your electricity retailer's online portal, which usually isn't a very useful portal. So make sure you get one of these little suckers and make sure you're shown how to use it so you can see how your solar is being used in your house in real time. So I've covered how many panels to buy, where to put them, what brands to consider, and explained panels, inverters, and monitoring. All that's left is to cover the biggest mistake I see when people buy solar, assuming an installer must be good because they install good brands. I have seen so many good brands badly installed, I know that's a dangerous assumption. The most important part of the solar equation is finding a good, ideally local, installer. Don't buy the cheapest deal on the internet and avoid door knockers. Do your research and scour online reviews. Two rules for looking at solar installer reviews online. One, read their one-star reviews. Everyone makes mistakes, but the good guys fix them. The bad guys just don't care. And look at multiple review websites. If an installation company has great reviews on one website and terrible reviews on the others, that's a sign they're gaming the system. Look for consistently good reviews across three or four reviews websites, including mine, of course, solarquotes.com.au. We've got tens of thousands of reviews of installers online. So that's an overview of installing solar in Australia. If you're hungry for even more information, go to my website, solarquotes.com.au. The site contains everything you need to research solar, from reviews of solar installers and hardware to payback calculators and even tools to help you find a better feed-in tariff. And when you're ready to take the next step, I'd be happy to arrange quotes from my network of over 500 vetted solar installers all across Australia. Just pop in your postcode at solarquotes.com.au and leave the rest to me. I literally guarantee you'll get a good install if you use my service. Thanks for watching.